Here we go. Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, System Engineer Skills for the Mix Engineer Part 2, presented by Chris Hoff and Ken Van Druten team. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during this webinar. However, as Raul mentioned, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at those sessions um, on our workshop series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily and we have over 20 sessions scheduled right now for September and October, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to the presenters for today's webinar. Chris Cookie Hoff holds a Bachelor of Music degree from Moorhead State University and has mixed live acts for nearly 30 years. He has toured as a front of house monitor or systems engineer with acts such as Styx, Josh Groban, Shania Twain, Ricky Martin, Justin Bieber, Blue Man Group, and Lords of Acid. Ken Pooch Van Druten is an experienced producer and live sound engineer with a degree from Berklee College of Music, three Grammy nominations and credits on multiple platinum and gold certified records. Over the years, Pooch has worked with Jay-Z, Travis Scott, Iron Maiden, Guns N' Roses, and others. And before I pass things off to Raul, I wanted to mention that Cookie and Pooch did hold a prior session on July 29th. And in case you missed it, I'll be sharing that link in a moment in the chat window. So watch for that there. Now over to you, Raul. Thank you, Laura, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our guests on this second part of System Engineer Skills for the Mix Engineer. Uh, put together by Cookie Hoff and Pooch Van Druten. Great to see you guys. How are you guys doing? Great to see you, Raul. Great to see you again. It's so so great. Thank you so much for joining us one more time. I think uh, Cookie, you you know hit it right on the nail when you said that you know we had so much more to cover. And I think this this session is going to allow our guest friends to actually uh, get into your brain a little more and a little more of the actual scientific details and the process that you go through in getting the system dialed in, you know, uh, in your case, uh, just for everybody who missed the previous session, let's remind everybody that, you know, you get to tune your own system, you know, for most of your sticks gigs, you you do both parts of the gig where you're the system engineer and the front house engineer. And of course, Pooch, you know, our, our, our great friend Pooch, you travel with two system engineers. <laughs> I'm the spoiled brat. Uh, you know, w one, from I know. one from Iron Maiden and one from Claire, which is, you know, we love it. So it's, it's, it's uh, great to be able to get that balance so you can tell us on, on your communication <laughs> process with your guys and how that comes about. Yeah, so absolutely. take it away, Cookie. Walk us through where we are. All right. So we were probably two hours in the last one and there's a lot of information to cover. So I uh, want to dial in just a couple more things. But first I want to say something here is, as audio engineers and artists, technology allows us to travel through time and distance to, to elicit emotions and memories and other humans with sound waves. And this is not something to be taken lightly. I mean, we're able to, to record things and all we're doing is just play, is just sound waves and <clears throat> the human brain interprets emotion and all those things from there. We have the ability to do that. And I think that's really awesome. Yes. So review from part one, we went through a brief history of system opt optimization tools. We talked about the evolution of the system engineer position, emergence of branded loudspeaker systems and specialized tools, and the importance of having a routine or checklist. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, Raul, if you want to. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll share real quick. If I, so there's that. I'm going to go one more. Okay. So. Just remind everybody from the previous session, again, like Laura said, we have posted the link on the chat box. We encourage you to go and, and really enjoy that first session, which went long, but it didn't seem like two hours. Time flew that day. Oh, um, you know, so the, the point we made at the beginning of that session was that the current positions of system engineering that we talked about nowadays didn't really exist. You know, back in the beginnings of, you know, when Cookie started at Audio Analyst, Butch, when you were touring with, you know, with Shoko, this concept that we have right now of a system engineer and the smart rig or, you know, your sim rig or whatever system you're using to analyze didn't exist. Back then, we had people that optimize systems mostly for installations or maybe for special events. And these are some of the people that kind of help grow that section of the industry. And then the gear that we use today, which is highly portable and very small, 
you know, the smart systems, even with all the mics and whatever interface we're using, you know, or even the current sim rig, you know, these systems back in the beginning were rather large. They didn't, you know, they were not very portable. They were actually pretty loggable. You know, they were not cheap. They were very, very expensive. So the concept that you can just throw this in your computer bag or your Pelican case and go to your next gig was not that simple. Not very many people had these analysis systems and those who had them really, you know, only use them for those kind of special events. So it's important to keep that as, as we move forward and, and, and notice the kind of technology that we have today. I and mean, this has happened over the last 20 years. So, you know, again, technology, you know, move forwards and that helped grow this new position we call system engineer. Back then, I think most, most of the time, we were lucky that the system was properly flown and that everything was properly patched. I mean, I think Pucci can talk, you talked a little bit about that where you go, okay, here are the keys, this car is running, you know. <laughs> That's it, I mean, we, we literally used to just point speakers at people, you know, I used to joke, it's like, no, you want to print the paper out at the body. <laughs> You're right. You know, and, you know That's literally and, what we would do. And Cookie, you spent a lot of time with Albert and the guys at Audio Analyst where they, you know, they were like, okay, do we have the right preset? Okay, that was the extent of the system tuning. I mean, it was like, do we have the right preset? Is the right system, you know, plugged in correctly to the right amp rack, you know? Uh, when did you start using, you know, analysis tools for, you know, yourself? Uh, first class on Smart was 98. And so it was early 2000s, I, I believe. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. And by, by that time, you know, the industry was pretty, pretty well advanced, you know, but obviously the changes, you know, that we saw from proprietary loudspeaker systems, you know, to loudspeaker systems developers by many manufacturers helped move things forward. So now some of these, uh, you know, systems from different manufacturers require specialized knowledge, whether you had a Vertec or a VDOS or a DMB system, you know, there were some particular knowledge that came with each brand, obviously, the advent and the, the growth of uh, digital signal processing help actually give us control of the different parts of the system where before there were so many different parts across the audio chain. Now everything kind of collapsed down to maybe everything in the amplifier or maybe a DSP box in, fr in front of the amp. So now we have access to all that, okay? Obviously computer control sound systems became a, a real you know, functional thing where it was, is a common thing nowadays to find a system that is networked. This is not something that happened in the past. In the past, you had an analog crossover with audio feeds to dumb amplifiers. And that was all you could control. You know, the, the availability that we have now for, you know, Wi-Fi and tablets and, and the remote capability to walk around, you know, have a portable rig, that didn't happen. So let's not take, you know, uh, this for granted. These are all uh, steps that have come to, to really help grow this position of system engineering and actually help us optimize uh, all of the systems. So that's uh, take a look at the previous video again, and uh, we will jump right onto it. So I'm going to stop sharing and give it back to Cookie. All right. Let's say, thank you for that. Get this. Thanks, Raul. That was a great <laughs> recap. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's get into this. So benefit to the mix engineer of knowing their way around system optimiz optimization. Now this is an, this is in quotes. A good mix will sound poor on an inappropriately tuned system. I think we can all agree on that. And a bad mix, air, it's quotes, it's all subjective, can sound better on, on an appropriately tuned system. And it's important for the mix engineer to understand how simple, simple system changes can greatly affect their mix presentation. Mm -hmm. So imagine this is your mix. It's got all these nice details. It's got all the little shiny bits, but you know, your glasses are smudged, your PA isn't tuned. That's what it's gonna look like. It's just not gonna come across the way you intended it. So tuning the system for your mix is very important. Uh, in the part one, talked extensively about target curves or reference, you know, traces or, or things like that. And the purpose of the target curve is to aid in consistency from show to show, even when our ears may be fatigued. Uh, we are right. human. We are animals. We get tired. You know, sometimes our ears are telling us something that may not actually be true just because they're tired. Uh, as covered in part one, the target curves that you use is up to you and you will it will depend on the genre you are working in and how your mix is balanced from the console. Some people need a uh, shelf down, some people need a shelf up. It's just how that they're set up from the console. You just got to figure that out. A common and that's approach related, to, that's, I just want to point that out, yeah. Cookie, that's related to SBL specifically too, right? Thanks, so yeah. 
um, you know, your target curve when you're talking about, you know, later on, you know, I'm sure you're going to say this, but later on, um, you know, if you're talking about an SPL where you're mixing sticks at 98, most of the time, your target curve is probably going to have just a little bit more high end than some dude that's mixing at 104. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so, uh, that, that target curve is related to SPL as well. Absolutely. Because, because I've noticed when, when I said, my system up and then I start to encroach beyond my SPL, it starts to hurt. So if I back it down, it gets comfortable. Or if I adjust the, the PA balance and keep the SPL, it, it, yep. it makes, it makes sense. So it's definitely uh, a one-to-one -one situation there. Uh, a common approach is to ensure that the loudspeaker system has a smooth or linear trend throughout the frequency range. Any hills or dips in response should be addressed since that is what your ear will hear. It's going to stick out to your ear that way. If there's a, a slight mound around like 500 to, to 1.5, that's probably, you're going to hear that, kind of address it so that it kind of has the same general trend. And I'll show you graphics a little bit later on. If your mix is balanced and sounds good in reference monitors and headphones, chances are the mix will translate to a system with a smooth trend. We've talked about this in, in part one of knowing your mix, listening to it on many sources, reference monitors, headphones, all that, besides just the PA. There's things that the PA are going to mask that you're not going to be able to hear um, from, from mix position because people cheering the room and all that stuff, but there's things that you can actually fix in your mix by going into a controlled environment of headphones or reference monitors and actually placing things or, or fixing gates, little, little tiny little details that'll help your, your live mix all the, all the more. And if you are consistently notching the same frequency out of every loudspeaker system, then check your mix and find the offending balance or input. It may be, it may be a guitar that's too hot at, you know, 2.5 or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, just to point out here, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, target curves, but also, you know, I always, and I know you do too, Cookie, you always look at the output of your console. I pay attention to that as well, because a well-balanced mix without any of that, without talking about speakers, um, will, will get you to, a, um, you know, a, a great goal with the target of what's coming out of the speakers. Um, you know, there, that's one of the biggest tricks that I always tell people, mixers, when they're first learning is use all the frequencies, man. Get that as linear as possible. Get your mix and, you know, the depth and, the, and what it sounds like will sound best when your, your mix coming out of your console is linear. Then what we're talking about is dealing with loudspeakers. So get that part right first. Oh, absolutely. So uh, an example of, let's see. See, yeah. Sorry, I, I had hit this when you started talking. Oh, Didn't sorry. To do that. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's all bad. It's all it's all my bad. So these names are just uh, just arbitrary. These are traces that actually I'm going to send on the chat here in a few minutes when I get get a chance. Uh, it's just different things. Like that's the one I use for for sticks. Uh, that's the PA flat response, as it's called, has has an X weighting. That's A weighting. There's C weighting. Uh, there's all, all three of them together. There's all kinds of choices that you, that can, you can do here. So here I just stack them all up so you can see them all together. But the, trace, the choices are really up to you. You just got to figure out what, what works for you. And those all sound drastically different in case you haven't uh, experienced what a, what a target curve looks like versus what it sounds like. Drastically different. And, and like the, the, the A, C, and X, that was just a, a flat response with the A, C, or X waiting on it. So you can kind of see where... The, the frequency range that matters for, for those weightings. Uh, typically, a lot of shows will do A weighting for, for SPL and, and things like that. Uh, one thing I do like to do when I'm tuning the PA is use ground plane measurements because the validity, the validity of the data provides better coherence in the mids and the, and the high frequencies. Uh, I've tried, I did it once. I put, I put the microphone in the grass. That's no good. It absorbs all the high frequency. There's no reflection. <laughs> Uh, so I'll use a case lid. Um, if, if I'm in an amphitheater with chairs, I'll put a pelican out there. I'll put a console lid, um, all kind of just trying to get a bigger flat surface that I can put the microphone on. And that reduces the bounce from the surface to the microphone. So your co coherence is better. You don't have a uh, uh, bad coherence or a phase dip or anything like that. Uh, certainly right. the easiest thing to do in arenas on the floor, as long as the chair crew isn't doing stuff or, or anything like that, just set the microphones on the floor. Uh, and and go from there. So, Cookie, a couple of things on this, you know, so the people who are not familiar with the ground plane measurement technique. So, one of the, the great things about it, not just are we eliminating the 
primary reflection from the floor up to the mic when you use a mic stand, but you're basically doubling the amount of direct energy. So your signal to noise ratio goes up by 60 dB, which is a great thing. Uh, keep in mind, if you're in an arena and you have a lot of road cases around you, you might have lateral reflections coming into your ground plane. So you wanna be cautious with that. Try to stay you know, at least 10 feet away from any road case or anything that will give you a sight reflection to that. Also, if you're going to use a surface that is hollow, you know, be cautious if you have any sympathetic vibrations that would make that road case or that console lid or anything else vibrate, which might be polluting your measurement. Obviously, this is the best way to go for anything that is going to be, you know, below 200 hertz. If you want to actually look at your subs and your low frequency content, uh, you know, ground plane measurements is a great way to go about it. Um, one of the things in the curves you were showing before, like you said earlier, you know, with target curves, is that these are unique to you know whatever target curve you use for you is, is this is not the prescription for everybody you're not saying this is the the only way to do it you have to find out what is the correct target curve for your application you know and whether you're doing metallica iron maiden or you're doing classical music you know that low frequency bump you know could you know it's going to change you know obviously that low frequency increase is completely directly related to the size of your array so how much of that you keep it's probably dictated by the kind of music you're gonna be, you know, doing. Um, yeah, I mean, as, so a, as a mix engineer, target curves are important to me because I create a mix that I think sounds great on XPA. Uh, right. And then I want, as I travel to other PAs, I want what's coming out of my console to sound similar. Correct. Um, and so that's that's really what. Um, yeah, it's, it's a reference for for the known variable, which is your mix. That's the known correct. quantity. Your mix is locked into your console. You know what's coming out of your mix. So you know that if the target curve of the get, you know, the PA that you're going into that day looks like your usual target curve, then you know that your mix is going to translate properly. You know, so it's something that you know it it helps validate you know wh what your mix is going to sound like. You know, obviously every PA has different transients, different dynamics, different headroom characteristics. But if you have, if you know what you're mixing into, you know, you, you can at least have a, a, a better guarantee of what the result is going to be, yeah. given that, you, you know, these, these predicates that you're not going to be changing all the EQs in your console as you're going about this. So the idea is get the system to basically, you know, get into this target curve so that you can keep your mix you know, as you have it dialed in and you already worked on your mix, wherever production rehearsals or at home on your studio monitors, however you went about to create your mix, you try to keep that locked in and then you basically adjust the system so that your mix translates into that. Yeah, that's a question that I get a lot as a mixer is how much does your mix change day to day? And it doesn't. Like yeah. my mix, what's coming out of my console is almost exactly the same every single yeah. day. And what I change is speaker. Yeah, one of the things we're going to talk about uh, towards the end of the presentation is, you know, what happens because both of you, you know, Cookie, you do it all the time where you're walking into, you don't carry racks and stacks. You pick up racks and stacks every time. Uh, Put, you do it through a lot of large festivals when you're touring with Iron Maiden. So, you know, not always you walk into a PA that you can actually, that, that you, you know, that might sound the way that you want it to sound or measure the way you need it to measure. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit later on about how that affects, you know, how that gets into your head or how do you keep that from getting into your head and how do you handle, you know, keeping, keeping, in, you know, your head in the game, you know, when you know the PA is not where it's supposed to be. So we'll, we'll definitely go through that. And I want to just commiserate with everyone out there when they do ground plane and the girl that sells the popcorn picks her mic up and goes, <laughs> why is this on the floor? You know, we, Thanks. we go through that on all of the TV awards that I do where for some reason, the air compressor for stapling things goes on exactly when we start doing this. That's exactly what it's like. It's the whole day it's off, except when we're tuning. Or building barricade. <laughs> exactly. Totally start building barricade anytime that you start putting pink in the PA. That's it's like, that's just yeah. the rules. It's the official call. Yeah. I've relied anyway. on tripods. I, I've set the tripods directly over the microphone. I've used, yeah. used the orange road pylons to try to alert. <laughs> I, I, I've seen people use like flashing strobe or <laughs> yeah. lights to say, hey, my microphone is, it's because it's, it's, you know, yeah. you have a thousand dollar microphone. It's getting better. Standard. Like people yeah. know now that we're doing that. But yeah. like right. when we first started doing that, that was my favorite thing. They, were like, <laughs> yeah. they, would, they would pick it up and bring it to you. Right. In front of house. <laughs> Thank you. Connected. <laughs> You're like, oh, you know. thanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Good times. All right. So in part one, uh, uh, we talked about a routine, in this case, my, my routine pretty extensively. But for this part two, we're going to zone in on this little section right here, which is, uh, you know, zoning correct, actually dealing with the, with the PA and just a little bit in a little bit more detail. So to start the routine, and this is just my routine, you know, just take from it what you will. The first step is, is zoning correct is your left, right, sub, fills, et cetera. Driving the correct rays, there's left or that's right, there's sub, there's fills, all right, you're good. Next, I would unmute and unmute each amp channel to verify circuiting and polarity. Because remember, impedance load will not tell you polarity. Performance manager, uh, LA manager, all those, they will tell you if, if there's a box not plugged in, but it won't tell you if, it, if the polarity is correct. So this is very important. You need to use your ears. And one of the methods that I use to do this and this is just a performance manager as an example, is mute and unmute adjacent uh, zones in the same frequency range. And as you work from top to bottom or bottom to top, yeah. you, you kind of hear that, you know, as the box starts to point down towards the floor, but you <clears> want to hear the summing and make sure it happens. So it ends up being more of a leapfrog for mids and highs. In this case, this box is, is two amp channels on the low, so it kind of is a centipede. But you want to kind of go through there and make sure that the, each soldier next next to the other soldier in line sounds the same and, and is helping out. And I think it's important. I think it's important, Cookie. Sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's important okay. that people learn what that sounds like the yeah. wrong way, like what comb filtering sounds like. And so, if you have the ability to flip something out of phase in relation to something else, um, you know, when you're learning, like learn what that sounds like. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Which we we'll go through that, and for people who are, you know. In performance manager, you know, you, you're only allowed to flip the polarity on the subs. Uh, but sonically speaking, you know, when you get two low frequency circuits, you know, on at the same time, you know, they obviously it, they should get louder, right? They're in the same polarity, so they should there's more energy summing together. I know, and the frequency pitch, like the, the way it sounds to you, should get deeper, yes. right? So if it gets quieter and the pitch goes up, they're very likely out of polarity. And, or you could have one of them disconnected or whatever. So it's always best to do the impedance check first, like Cookie was saying, and then go through these. And I encourage people to do the same thing with the mids and even some of the highs. You know, obviously you're not gonna hear all the highs, but with the mid frequencies, you can do them in banks of three to kind of figure out how they're summing. I think it'll, it'll tell you a tonality that, but it's important that you have a reference. So, you know, so you do it at the shop at some point in time so you know what yeah. you're gonna be walking into. Well, I think it's a common mistake. I've watched system engineers just, you know, page through stuff. And mm -hmm. as long as it's blowing some sort of noise through it, they ignore what it sounds yeah, like. Absolutely. And to me, this is the crucial moment. This is the yeah. moment where you get to decide if that speaker is really acting like it should. Yeah. And you shouldn't just be blowing through it and being like, yeah, it works, it works, it works, it works. Yeah. You should be, it works and it sounds right. No, absolutely. And like we discussed in one of our previous sessions, you know, if you're using multi-conductor, you know, cables like, you know, 19 conductor socket packs or anything else like that, uh, we use uh, the new LK25s, you know, don't assume, you know, those have two, two NLAs out of the breakout or maybe three NLAs out of the breakout. Don't assume that, you know, anything is correct. Your assumption could, could you know, kill you one of these days because we have run into situations where the entire upper half of the array was out of polarity with the lower bottom half of the array because somebody wired the entire breakout out of polarity. Yeah. In other words, every bandpass, not just the lows, was out of polarity. But that meant that you know boxes one, two, three, four, five, six, those were all within polarity to themselves, but completely out of polarity to the rest of the array. So just just kind of keep that in mind. You know, do, do not assume. It's an important thing. Hey, Cookie, I noticed on your uh, diagram there, or video of what you were happening, uh, you were doing kind of a jigsaw uh, thing. Can you explain more about the reasoning that you do some of that stuff? So on, on this particular example, the, the circuits, it's two boxes per circuit and all the mids and all the highs of each box are on one amp channel, but the lows are actually separate amp channels on, on this. So in this case, it was a VTX V, uh, V25, mm -hmm. one of the 15s was on one amp channel, one, the other 15 is on the other amp channel. So I'm just first making sure the box is, is, is in phase with itself and I'm taking one of those drivers because now, now it's correct and, connect, and, and comparing it to the next box. Now that driver is correct, so now I'm comp comparing it to the next, to the next uh, 15 in the same box and working my way down. And, and here's another funny thing that we have actually discovered, which is that it is supposed to be channel one of the amplifier if you're using four channel amps. 
channel one should be the left low frequency driver, low one, and channel two should be the right low frequency driver, low two. But we have run into situations where whoever wired the Amtrak or you know whatever is happening, that those two could be reversed. Again, wow. don't don't assume. Yeah, you know, so just just kind of go to the lows and kind of you know verify. This is all stuff that normally on a tour gets checked, you know, before you go out. But uh, you know, it's 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 something that when you're doing one-offs, you know, you at least want to have the idea of, the, the, of what it's supposed to sound like when you walk into it. And I must point out, we're showing performance manager here, and thank you, Kuki. I know you toured with VTX before. Um, but you know, these calls up on the system engineer. If you're going to be the system engineer and the mix engineer you need to learn the different software platforms to be able to go through this. Whether you're doing it on a DMB rig or an L acoustics rig or on a JBL rig, you know, it, it's, it basically it's up on you to actually go and educate yourself to figure out how to go about this. You know, maybe you'll have somebody helping you that day, you know, to actually go through this, but you don't know. Maybe they send you somebody who just knows how to fly the PA and plug it in, but doesn't know how to do this or doesn't know what they're listening for. So you need to be able to know how to get around that software platform. And through all the software platforms, it's, it's, it's the same goal, but maybe slightly different terminology in, right. you know, in, their, in their platforms. And like in part one, we were talking about just educating yourself on these different things. So you could speak in, in terms that maybe the, the system engineer or the, the, house, the house tech knows. If you could say, hey, that the CPL, if it's a DMB rig, what's the situation on that? Right. Is that you know, it's too bright for me towards the bottom and then they can get into there. Just, just know what, what's available to you. Just kind of take, a, you don't have to be certified. Just kind of take a glance and get comfortable with it so you know the terminology and what the software is capable of and, and what it's not capable of. Right. Yeah, I was just getting, you, you said exactly what I was going to say is that you, you need to know the verbiage to be able to communicate what you're talking about, where the low end crossover point is, is often discussed in a different terminology for each manufacturer, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, talking about Zoom or talking about, you know, everybody talks about it differently. So you, you have to know that experience. Cookie, can you run that video one more time just so that you, they can see exactly what your, your sure. true situation is just because so, I, I just want people to see that so start with the high frequency and just kind of work your way down and this also you know it kind of gets you comfortable with how how the pa sounds top to bottom like the top boxes are over your head the bottom boxes are you know blasting off the floor and then of course i speed this up there's no way i could do this in real time that fast <laughs> uh, unless i'm super caffeinated maybe but <laughs> no but i want people to see like what you're doing in what orders um yeah. you know see like on the bottom there how your your jigsaw and stuff there and yep yeah. yeah, just kind of just com comparing. And once you get th through the whole thing, the whole array compared to the other whole array, because, you know, maybe, yes, it's in phase, but maybe the drive line isn't quite right. You know, you want to make sure that right. the, the whole, you know, the whole meal there compares to the, to the other one as well. And this, right. is so this is something I actually learned from Scott Sudgeon, who uh, works for L Acoustics. And when he showed me this, I, I, I just smacked my head like, oh, my God, why didn't <laughs> I think, about, think, think of this earlier? He yeah. said, oh, you just leapfrogged down. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, one, one additional step to this that I'm sure uh, Pucci went through this with Ted Leamy, because I went through this with Ted Leamy, which was, you know, he would have me stand in the middle and go, okay, turn on the, you know, the lows on the left, you know, yep. half the array, turn on the lows on the right, then put them, do they sound the same left to right? And they put them both together. Are they summing to you in the middle? Now do the so left, you know, left to right, left to right, left to right through the whole array. You know, uh, I think that's important to don't assume that because the array itself you know, it's in polarity, it means that the other array, you could have an entire array out of polarity. And so when you go from driver to driver, it will all look, you know, sound correct, but left to right, they're out of polarity. I went through that when somebody inserted a graphic, the insert cable was out of polarity on the right side. So just, just kind of, again, don't assume, you know, and, and mind you, this part of the exercise, you can do it without console being plugged in. You can do it pretty early on because this is all done through the amplifiers, right? You don't need any additional... Uh, console or sources, everything comes directly from the amplifiers to do this part of the of the exercise. Not to be a dead dead horse, but analogy that just came to mind was you, you basically you want to walk. You don't you want to keep both feet on on the ground at one time. Yeah. Rather, one foot is on one PA, one array. The other foot is then on the other one. You never want to jump between. You always want to have a direct comparison of yeah. adjacent things. So cool. So because in the morning or in the early afternoon, this is your chance to get it right because it's not going to happen during sound check or the show. It's it, it's yeah. already too late. Uh, and and one, more, one more note on that. I think, okay, everybody should do that part of the exercise before 
they actually send the feeds from their console through their whatever lake or Galileo, whatever they're using BSS, you know, to drive the amplifiers. Because I think you want to know that everything from the amplifier to the speakers is correct. So that that's a known quantity. All the amps are patched to the right circuit you know oh, somehow you open the bottom circuit and you hear it from the top well something is wrong so confirm that everything from that amp to that speaker is correct now just backtrack and go okay are all the outputs of my whatever like galileo bss is going to the right cluster and that's something obviously you can look at all the inputs of the amp racks to go okay i can see that when i open my left I only see the main left or, you know, or, you know, and then you can backtrack to whatever, however you're driving the PA. Is it a matrix? Is that you're coming out of the left and right? Because, you know, half the time your PA could be completely right. And then you could have something out of polarity out of your processor or out of the console. So again, don't assume that because you did the test and everything was in polarity, you know, up between the Amprex and the speakers, you could have something that is reverse polarity between console and processor or processor and Amprex if you're going analog. So just be cautious with that. Absolutely. All right. So let's get, get into uh, how I end up approaching this. I always tune with PA right. It's just out of habit. And as we discussed in part one, typically PA right is the first one to go up because that's where the monitor guys are. They got to get started. And as far as audio, we look, we look out after our own, you know, I guess that's, I guess that's how it is. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just generally the, the first, first points in the air, right? <laughs> Uh, so match a general high frequency trend of the circuits, uh, four, or mic four or more mics on axis, e one in each zone. Zones with similar throw distance may not each get their own mics. So I personally travel with, with just five, five mics. One of them is at front of house console all the time, and I have four, and that's used for SPL and, and, and all those things. Uh, I have four that I put out in the audience uh, during the day to, to tune all this stuff. And generally what we, you will see without any shading is that video on the, on the upper left and right where that hand points, you'll see that the bottom zone has a high rise in, uh, in high frequency response. And the manufacturer's putting that in there because they're, they don't know how far from the audience uh, the box is gonna be, but they have to assume it's probably at least 30 feet. So in order to compensate for the air loss in the preset generally, there mm -hmm. is a high, high frequency boost. Now, if you put that box in front of you on the edge of the stage and you sit three feet from you, it's going to tear your head off because it's going to be super bright. It's not intended to do that in yeah. a normal, a normal line array throw configuration. Yeah, so that's a good thing I can you know, mention to people. Obviously, the presets, at least in our uh, software platform, you know, when you drag our VTX boxes into an array, the software knows that you intend to use the box on a long throw application. And so the preset that automatically it's going to get loaded into the amp is a preset that contains, you know, p positive shelving to counteract all the effects of high frequency loss at a given distance. And we're, you know, we're basically looking at a distance between 150 and 200 feet. So obviously if your first row of seats is 20 feet from the bottom box, you're going to see that positive shelf, you know, you know, in the response that you're measuring. And that's why we give you the tools to actually properly correct or high frequency shade that particular circuit. Uh, for those of you watching Cookie, you might want to explain to them the phase response because they might go, okay, what, what are you measuring that the oh. phase response is not, not linear? Yeah, so this is something I had to generate here in the, in the lab, in the cookie jar, I guess, if, if you will. So this is all done just uh, with plugins and, and things, like, things like that. Yeah, actually, this is not I the actual measurement of a loudspeaker cabinet. This is uh, all recreated via virtual DSP, okay? Correct. So the, that's why the phase response looks the way it does. Yeah, I end up having to use a quarter inch tape machine with a flux crank way up to get it to, get it to dance. <laughs> and part of that modeling is, is, a, is a wacky uh, phase on top. But this is kind of what you're gonna see from, from yeah. a, a big PA. And I think some people may not have ever had the chance to, to work on a large format PA system. Um, yeah. But you're going to, this is kind of what, what you're going to see. Yeah, the, your, your frequency responses are exactly what you would see if you're at the front, the middle, and the back, pretty much. Correct. And then, so the video on the, on the bottom left there, that's after doing some shading uh, for, the, for the bottom zones to try to get them all to kind of trend the same. Now, in this case, they all kind of trend up, which is fine. You can treat that later globally, but mm -hmm. you, just got, you want to just kind of calibrate the different zones. Uh, some engineers, this, they prefer to leave the high frequency in there. So it gets louder as you get closer to the stage. That's the vibe they want. That, that, that's cool. That's not the vibe I, I go for I, because I'm trying to keep SPL even. 
uh, and kind of have the same experience because the mix will will sound differently as you start to have a rise in yeah. in, in the high frequency and things like that. So and and you know a couple of quick comments. You know, as you will see, you got. I know you're going to show some of the line array calculator here. Um, that will serve you as a guide, and I, I'll say that again as a guide. And you can obviously import that data from the LAC into our performance manager software. And I think the reason I emphasize guide as a guideline is because. You, you have to take into consideration how much energy is going to be coming off the stage. You know, if you have a very loud stage, remember that the LAC is doing everything in a vacuum. It's, in a, it's a very, there is it's not considering any energy coming off the stage. So for a live show with side fills or monitors or guitar amps, or, you know, I don't know what you have, you know, if you have any sources on stage, you know, for either of you guys, um, I typically find that in those situations, all of the shelving, you know, some of the shelving will probably come back a little bit just because, it's a lot louder, you know, closer to the stage just because of the energy. If you have a show that it's it's completely quiet on the stage, then this will actually work, you know, uh, by the book. And if you look at that lower, lower video, you see that there's one trace in there that has kind of a hump around 500. And something like that, I would look at, before I look at the average, I would look to see where it's coming from and, and look where that microphone, maybe I put it in the place where there's a reflection or something like that. So mm -hmm. it'll all get averaged out. Uh, if it actually is valid, and of course this is simulated, so the co coherence is high. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it is actually valid, then it'll get treated, it'll get weighted in in the in the overall average. So that, hey, that's hey. that's something you may see. You just got you got to figure out which which zone is is doing it, and, and possibly why it's causing. Maybe it's environmental. Hey, Cookie. Uh, again, not to assume. I'm assuming that people who are joining us in the session realize that this is a split screen where the top part of the screen is face. And the bottom part of the screen is uh, frequency response. Uh, so that's just so that everybody, it's, for the, who's somebody who's never looked at this screen before, they're gonna go, "What are we looking at here?" So you got phase and frequency response on each section. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot that, that that we're kind of assuming that the people are, you know. Yeah, and that's, that's why I just I just wanted to clarify that for you. If you have never seen a, a dual FFT analysis software package, you know the upper part of the of the screen. You know, it's a phase response, and the the, the bottom part is a frequency response. So just just keep that in mind. And I think Absolutely. the point you were trying to make, Cookie, definitely uh, with the that hump around five hundred low mid stuff mm -hmm. is sometimes I've seen guys do the common mistake is looking at it in your software and your smart software and saying, "Oh, there's a huge bump there. I'm going to make a giant cut in it." Right. Um, whereas the reality of that is probably since that's showing up like on only one of the traces, there's maybe something going on right. environmentally. I think that's important to point out. Yeah, which talks, you know, like Cookie mentioned, you know, you, you know, ultimately you want to look at the average of the four mics, you know, when you make a, a big EQ decisions, you know, look at the average. Yeah. Hey, Raul, quick yeah. interruption from me. If, if everybody looks in their chat window, I have put the download link to the trace curves that Cookie oh. was referencing. Awesome. So let me know if you have any issue with downloading that, and I can send it um, directly to your email. Yeah, if anybody has any problems downloading the traces and everything else, please let us know in the chat, and, and we'll figure out a way to get them to you. And the major caveat is, you know, that isn't the be all end all. It's just just an idea of, of something that, that you could work towards. Uh, but there's plenty of them in there. Maybe try something and, and see what's close and then modify mm -hmm. it as, as you need to. But in, in an effort to ensure consistency, that's something that that I use is is the trace and, and just try to figure out what, what works, you know, for my setup coming out of the console and, and continue from there. Right. So your people looking at traces to me is akin to someone using a preset for a plugin, right? Like mm -hmm. people think that a preset for a plugin is like the be all end all. I'm going to pull up that preset and it's going to be the greatest vocal of all time. Well, right. that's not what your intention is by giving you guys these traces. They're just showing you an idea of how, what you do. Um, yep. Absolutely. Yep. So in this video, uh, so in the, in the window right, right there, you see all the, all the rise in the, in the lower boxes. And I have uh, microphones in each of the zones. And something yep. I may end up doing is just, just a shelf, just to counteract the preset uh, air absorption filter that's in there. Because once that happens, I'm just trying to get all of those zones. Let's see if it'll do it. They kind of trend the same. See right there? Now they're, yep. all, they're all kind of the same. So now if I, need, if I need to shelf it up or shelf it down, it's 
it's one global EQ as opposed to going into each zone. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great thing in there, Cookie, that you have the average curve, which is that white dotted line. You have that on. So yep. you can see as you as you do a, an adjustment in one of the circuits, you can see how that affects you know the average curve, and that's that's very important. As you're as you're making adjustment to any of the circuits, you know you want to see wh what the average is doing, you know overall. Correct. Yeah, and to explain that, you know, zones with a similar throw distance may not get the, each get their own mic. In this case, I'm only carrying five, so what I would probably do is is put mic number four up in the balcony kind of halfway through the seating plane and just, just kind of have it be be the general area but i'm using this to illustrate because we're, we're not able to actually get into the venue and video you know put mics out there things but this right. is just just uh just something that that would be part of of the normal day mm -hmm. um, of putting the right. microphones in these zones to, to see what they're doing and this will help to validate what you're hearing when you walk around later you still you still got to walk but at least it, it gets the major chunks and blocks and boulders moved so that mm -hmm. when you walk you're doing much finer adjustments not doing wild adjustments and, and things like that and when you walk from back to front or front to back that's the time to listen to your shading and make sure that it, it makes sense now it's going to sound you know as you walk on axis away from you know for instance pa right as you start to get out 30 40 50 feet you're gonna start to hear uh, pa left come into play you're, you're gonna hear it you can hear the, your space in 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 the room but just listen to that PA, you know, that you're on access to it and just make sure that it's a, it's a smooth trend as, as you start to walk back. If you walk into a zone and it's suddenly, whoa, what, what happened there? It's, it's probably a shading or, or, some, or something right. going on. You just, you just want to have it be consistent. Now, we're, we're probably the only ones uh, that are actually going to walk between zones and, and listen to the PA, except unless somebody goes out for a beer, right? But they're right. Not, not, not paying attention to how the zones sound. Right. So, you know, if you're in a like the audience member is going to come in and they're going to sit in a zone and that's that's going to be their their world for the for the show they're not going to notice all that stuff but we need to know that our reference point at front of house or, yeah. or wherever we're mixing from is is pretty accurate to to the rest of the of of the of the room you know we should also are, go ahead sorry go ahead please. i think there are people that sit in between zones so it is kind of important you know like if you're in that row that's like right between a zone I, mm -hmm. those, that's the squirrely part. At least me is when I walk around as a mixer, I'm like, why wow, this is a little squirrely like right here. And it's, and so getting the shading right between the zones, I think is really important. I think this is also a great time when you're going through this exercise in the building to actually get familiarized with whatever room acoustics are affecting some of the areas, you know, that, that you can do nothing about. You know, you might have a situation on an under balcony, you might have a situation with a glass reflection. You know, there might be some issues, you know, also keep in mind that the room is gonna change when the audience comes in. So that's that. Um, also, these process that you're showcasing, uh, Cookie, works very well for, you know, today's LAN array systems, you know, whether you, it's a JBL or L acoustics or whatever. Uh, obviously, if we go back to when you were using Alto, you know, type of subtle boxes or put when you were mixing on Prism, you know, this approach, it's a lot more convoluted. You're not going to have such a coherent, you know, uh, waveform coming to you for measurement, you know, the amount of energy that it gets, you know, dispersed all over the place. So it's a lot more difficult to actually control it and to actually go through this approach when you have a, you know, old school trapezoidal type system. For sure. One thing I find useful there is is to use averages. Use put several yes. mic microphones out in the audience, and don't don't stress about one particular zone. Just what's uh, the general attitude of of the PA in the room? Absolutely. And, and go absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So here is an overview. So we'll just kind of blast through it. You're going to match the level of the subs between the floor and ground. Match the phase response of them. Set the target curve to match the level of the subs. Capture a phase trace average of the floor range array. Capture phase trace average, except for the closest mic of the sub, because that tends to be too close. And if you have a center arc, it's the phase is kind of wacky. So I kind of step back a little bit from him. So I turn that microphone off on the average. Match the phase response with delay and polarity at crossover point. Set the gain of the full range array to get as close to the target curve as possible. And then apply a corrective EQ. Anything in orange like this is a caveat. To a group that contains the full range array and the subs, because you may be EQing across the crossover point. Yes. So let's get in the fir first couple steps here. Match the level of subs between the flown and ground and match the phase response of the flown and ground subs. What you want to do is you want, you want it to be one unit. You want it to be subs. You don't want to be subs air or subs ground. You just want it, want it to be subs. So you get them to be, to be similar. 
and then set the target curve to match the level of subs. In this case, there's a CNET video. That's my, my first step is I typically do not attenuate subs. I usually run those at zero because in my curve that I'm using, as you can see, it's a pretty big sub bump. So I want the energy out of there. Typically what happens is I end up attenuating the full range array down to continue the rest of the target curve. I will is, say here, Cookie, I'll interrupt you real quick because yeah. to me, this is the, where, you know, the black arts of dealing, <laughs> dealing with audio or subs in general. Um, and I tend to work with bands, well, at least the, the older rock bands that I work with, um, where they don't want any sub information on stage. So then we play this whole game of where the source of the low end is coming from mm -hmm. low end meaning sub information is coming from um and i tend to we walk this weird you know wire in iron maiden between having the flown subs be more prominent than what's happening on the floor so as not to screw the band on stage yeah. uh, and so um, I, I know what you're saying about, you know, Hey, get them both in line and get them, you know, working together. And then you attenuate the whole thing. But there are a bunch of us out there that play this weird game of like, you know, turning up the, the flown subs versus the low, which changes the phase, which, you know, yeah. Uh, and, so and not, um, not only for all rug band but also on a lot of TV award shows, you know, we go, right. one of the things that I always try to do when I'm advancing some of the shows is to try to try to have them have a, as many handles out of the console as possible. So flown subs on a stereo matrix, ground subs on a separate matrix, you know, main PA, outside PA. So a lot of handles it may be going through however many process or channels, but uh, that gives me the ability to, so if I get into a situation very quickly in a sound check or a part of the, the, the rehearsal blocking process, where sometimes it's the opposite. I might have an artist that wants very, very little subs on the stage area, or I might have a reggaeton artist who really wants to fill the subs of the stage and I just got to step on the ground subs and I don't want to just kind of throw everything up. So having, having a, a direct handle at the console kind of helps with some of those things. I think for the measurement purposes and the time alignment and balancing, I think what, what Cookie's mentioning is critical, which is that you want to sort of start with the best scenario, which is make everything the same level, try to get the levels correct and then do your time alignment via the phase response matching. And to that, oh, you yeah. want to get, get the levels correct. How you, how, what I feed to those zones might change for each artist. And yeah, and also we need to, you know, you it need to be very clear, maybe mixers don't know this versus system engineers, that when you start messing around with volume, you also start, you know, messing around with a bunch of other things too. So just... I know it's great to have those handles and the ability to do it quickly in a situation like a TV show. Yep. But I, you know, I need to stress to mixers. It's like, that's not something that you should just be messing around with all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Gonna, you know what I mean? Yeah. So. And if you're on tour, you may, you may find that you always want your ground subs to be down six dB and then, and then go for it. But, but start here. Your, your time alignment is going to be, the phase is going to change as you change your level. Yeah. So, Get, to get those things in time is, is important. And then just figure out how much salt and pepper you're going to need and then continue from there and then make it part of the routine every day. Mm -hmm. But if you're just starting out, try this th th and see what happens. Yeah, I'm curious, Cookie. Um, most of you, are, when you're advancing, because you're picking up racks and stacks pretty much everywhere you go, do you, do you, you your spec calls for flown subs and ground subs or how yes. do you go about that? Yep, absolutely. Because okay. I definitely prefer flown subs. It's just hard to get them in a lot of places because it's just, it's extra money. People say, oh, we, we have six subs on the ground on each side, you know. Or maybe some of the venues you're going into, rigging points are scarce, yeah. you know, sure. Yeah, but it, having flown and ground, it, you, 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 can't, you can't steer a car with, you mm -hmm. know, with only one, you know, with uh, half the steering unit you know, or, or yeah. bicycle. <laughs> Absolutely. So in order to triangulate and, and move the lobe, move the summing around, you need more than one point two, possibly three, points mm -hmm. to actually be able to position the summing in the room yeah. so the more zones you can do like that it's not about spl it, although when the audience gets in there it, the ground subs are going to go away a little bit because they're yeah. pushing through, through people. and uh, butch are you doing the same are you flying you know with your clear package on maiden are you carrying uh probably carrying cp218s yep flown and, and flown and and ground stack okay and do any of those get uh, set up in cardioid blocks they do, yeah. They the, do. Uh, uh, both the flown and the ground yeah. are yeah, fa yeah, fantastic. 
steerable. You know, I mean, uh, Cookie, you just said something there that I think it, it needs some, it needs to be emphasized in that, you know, we're not talking about SPL, we're talking about coverage. The mm -hmm. black art of subs is coverage, like getting it even everywhere, you know, um, yeah. that that's the, the game. Yep. All right. So now that we have the subs in a group, now we're going to capture a phase trace average of the full range array. We're going to match the, fa match the phase response with delay and polarity at the crossover point and set the gain of the full range array as close as possible to the target curve. So in this situation here, there's a full range array and there's, there's the trace of the phase on, on top, but there's the subs. The subs are to the right and in smart, that means they're ahead in time. So you've got to delay the subs back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now both zones again. Now, Still not at the, at the target curve, so I'm just going to attenuate the full range of array to get as close to that. Use as few EQ filters as possible. A lot of times it's just level uh, to get to get to that. But it's it's important to, to kind of recognize it. You know, that's you know that spacing on there. That's about, about four, anywhere from four to five milliseconds. And as you start to use use F, dual FFTs, you'll kind of get comfortable with it. And but like I said, in smart, if it's to the right, if the phase trace at the crossover point is to the right, it's ahead in time. You just delay it back because phase is time. That's what they'll stress anytime you go to these these classes. Phase is time. So, and then something to note here. So there's a full range array added with the subs, but you see that problem right there? That's all it is is polarity. So they should actually sum across. So that's something to look out for. If you see a dip there, you're not going to EQ that. That's that's a time or that's a polarity thing. So that that's an easy fix. Uh, to do with and you know to get it back to that that was no EQ filters that was just polarity so just have have that little bit of knowledge in your toolbox comfortable so that if you see that it's it's an easy fix or it's a slight time shift not a big deal and now use the average volume x to match the target curve and apply a corrective EQ so there it was a little high and I'm just going to pull that top down but once again this is a group that contains a full range array and the subs in this case there is a, a shelf that I had to add to get get it to match the curve. And there's a couple little filters I had to do on the subs to get it to, uh, to settle in on, mm -hmm. on there. Yes, indeed. Uh, for, the front, for the fills, place the closest mic on a stand on axis with a fill where the high frequency of both the fill and the full range PA converge. So where the audience member is gonna hear both zones, that's where you need to make sure their time. As you step away from one of the zones into the next one, it doesn't matter what time it is, what the delay time is. But when, whenever you're in multiple zones, you need to make sure the rivals are, are as close as possible. You know, one point, Cookie, uh, as we said earlier about the preset that gets loaded into the amps when you drag the cabinets into the arrays, uh, when you have distributed fills, front fills or otherwise, uh, the software sees that you have one cabinet, so it automatically assumes that you're going to use this as a standalone fill. So instead of loading a preset with the shell for the for the long distance throw it loads a preset that is flat so in, so in some circumstances it's going to happen is the opposite you're going to end up you know if you have a lot of energy coming off the stage or you know that you like the pace slightly you know tilted up a little bit you might end up actually shelving that that preset up a little bit you know depending on what your target curve is you know obviously if your target curve is like yours you know it's, it's slanted you know you'll want to apply that shelf down but just so that people know that the preset that gets loaded into a front fill in our case is a flat preset. And it's definitely not the case for, for all the manufacturers, which sometimes I run into uh, yeah. I'm adding 80, 18 dB shelf to cut that stuff because yeah. it's, you know. Again, in front of back to education. You definitely need to know yeah. that. Yeah. And then I try to match the fill response for the target curve because that's how my mix is set up to be listened to from 200 hertz to 10K within reason. I'm not trying to make the box do anything it's, it's not gonna to wanna to do. I'm not adding a huge shelf to it. If I have to add a huge shelf, then I'm actually just gonna cut lows and change, change the level of it. But right. just, you know, keep it, keep it, with it within reason. And below 200 hertz, and this is, you know, genre specific, how loud your stage is, you know, maybe I'll let, a, let some 100 through and have it up there. But generally from 200 hertz to 10K, that's, that's usually where I'm, where I'm looking. And then, after that, capture response to the full range PA with the closest mic. And then you're gonna match the level and delay of the full range array with a fill loudspeaker or use the Haas effect to localize the image by allowing the fills to be one and a half to two milliseconds ahead of the full range array, which, which is what the, we're doing is making the fills the first arrival at the listening point. And what that does is draws the brain, the brain's attention gets drawn to that. It interprets all the other uh, uh, arrivals as, as echoes. 
as long as it's within 40 milliseconds. If it's beyond 40 milliseconds, then the Haas, Haas effect states that it's, it's a separate sound source. If you're within 40 milliseconds, that... Yeah, that, I think for, I think for some people, it's even less than that nowadays. You know, and people should also remember that level, you know, you know there's a, a converse curve there where if you, you know, delays things, you can actually increase the level more. So, you know, there's a window that you want to play with. Ultimately, you want to spend some time sitting out, you know, out there and trying to check that out. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, this is a conversation I have a lot with my system engineers about where it feels like where the source is coming from. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be sitting in a chair in the fifth row and it's the audio feels like it's coming from way up there. I absolutely. want I have all the focus of, you know, to be looking at the band and feel right. like the audio is coming from there. And that's, you know, we, I, we mess around with, uh, you know, front fills and that to, to gain that kind of experience. What, what size front fills are you guys uh, using on your, on your uh, arena tours, uh, Pooch with the Clarity? They are, uh, well, there's a, <laughs> there's a bunch of different ones up there. Because uh, you, you have some significant monitors on stage. I mean, your monitoring package for Bruce is not exactly, you know, yes. <laughs> tiny little things you, you, you know yes and it's uh all kinds of different manufacturers up there as well uh, right and, and so it is kind of a mishmash of but but you do carry a, a significant front field package i would assume to actually yeah. bring bring so the image it's, down it's mostly claire cp6s across the front which is their small version um but there's a center cluster that is all vocal uh, that is um, old school uh, VDOS uh, trap boxes. I forget what they. I think they're arcs. Arcs. Yep. Yeah, and so those those are ground stack sort of uh, in front of the stage, in and the they're center. just yep. Bruce's vocal, just his vocal. And the reason is with all of that energy that's coming off of the stage from monitors and guitar amps pointing the first few rows, the, mm -hmm. the vocal was getting lost a little bit. So by just having, you know, there's CP6s which have full mixes, but then right. there's in the center clusters, it pushes the vocal just over the top a little bit for that, you know, first. And, and that feed comes from you or from your monitor guy? From you. Fantastic. Yep. So there's two, in my world, there's two front fill feeds. There's sure. one that's a, you know, a, a full mix and one that's, that's not. It's very Broadway of you. <laughs> There's something I want to point out. You know, this slide is about fills, but this also goes for under balconies. It also goes for lawn, lawn delays, all that yeah. stuff. Um, I, I've walked onto lawns and uh, at, in amphitheaters, sat, you know, sat on the grass. And it sounds like, like, the, like the band is from the edge, you know, the lip of the, of the covering. You, you don't want that. You want, you want to make sure that it's, it's, you know, it looks like it sounds. It sounds like it looks. Yeah. And, and what that allows you to do is uh, you can actually, with, with your level, your, your level kind of changes. If you can tuck it in slightly behind, you can bring your, bring your level up and like you mentioned, and it, it doesn't present a problem with, with that. But as soon as you, you kill those delays, suddenly it's, okay, where'd everything go? Mm -hmm. So along with flown subs, which help to throw the, the low end information to the lawn as opposed to the ground subs, which get, get subbed up, uh, you can use the Haas effect and, and bring it in, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful effect. It, it works really well and, it, and it, it helps with the enjoyment of, of the concert for the people on the lawns. Cookie, yeah. I assume that you make it a point to get out to all those under balconies and, and, and when you're doing all the sheds to get out to the grass, because this sounds, sounds kind of silly, but I, I, I have seen plenty of engineers who are also the system engineer who just don't go out there. And you know, there are some situations what ends up happening is the misalignment between the two systems just creates a very uncomfortable. And that's right. If you are completely in the back of the lawn, okay, you're sitting out there. But that middle transition, if everything is really not properly aligned, it becomes really uncomfortable for the audience. So I wonder if you ever you you make it a point to make it out there. I, I guess absolutely because you are responsible for how it sounds. If if the tour manager comes down and says, hey, it's it's really weird on the lawn but you're in the middle of a show mixing, you know, doing your sure. hit cues. You don't have time to fix that. And you're just guessing, right? you know, so it's the prep work. It's a lot of prep yeah, work. And, and I'm sure Butch, you get to chat with your, with your two guys about that. And they have that pretty well covered, you know, when they're doing yeah, absolutely. their thing. And they walk it during the show too. Um, yeah. You know, uh, it, it's an important thing. Um, I just want to point out that there are two different philosophies with speakers that are related to listening to something with the main PA and then using a speaker in addition to that. 
there's kind of two different philosophies there. There's guys that utilize front fills, for example, as a PA speaker, trying to get full range, good, you know, like blasting kind of club sound, like standing in front of that front fill versus intelligibility, bringing mm-hmm. up that front fill to be just filling in what's already coming from up there. And I tend to be the second guy. I tend to be the guy that's like, all I want those to do is intelligibility, bring them up enough Mm -hmm. so that the feeling is there. Whereas versus an under balcony or a speaker that is not getting any information from the main left and right PA, that's a whole other kind of tuning thing. Um, Is is that how you do your stuff too, Cookie, is is intelligibility in the front fill? And then, you know, uh, with a balcony speaker, maybe more full range? Yeah, I'm lucky enough to have a quiet stage. One thing that's coming off there is a snare drum and a boatload of cymbals. But uh, I, when I have been SE for bands that have live cabinets on stage and, and things like that, yeah, what you're sending to the front fills is going to change. Maybe it's more vocal and no guitar. Yeah. But certainly walking into, I mean, it's a guideline. You, you want to you wanna start, start with the, you know, your, your familiar letterhead you, with, your, with, your, <clears throat> with your blank page. And that's part of what all this, this tuning will do but you still need to walk into that zone and sit there and think, okay, is this really how I want it to sound with the PA on? And you may, may maybe need to make adjustments to it, but it could be, you know, not nitpicking little, little EQ, you know, uh, cues. It may be just a broad shelf, just kind of just a general, general slope of things. You still need to listen to it. You're still responsible for it. Absolutely. You know, and some, and then you have all the different applications from going from an indoor standard Schubert type theater to, you know, an arena, a shed, an outdoor, you know, stadium kind of a gig, the front fill application, you know, it's going to change. You know, if you go, you know, and you do, for example, something like Electric Daisy Carnival, where your main stacks could be 90 feet apart. Now, you know, the producer wants, you know, the first 30 feet of audience to be blasted. So you end up putting, you know, another inside stereo PA that is six boxes ground stack, you know, which subs just because you need to just step on. So that that's not your typical front fill system, but it's application based. You know, what, what is the need? You it's know? application we based to, uh, sorry, cookie. We used to cookie when cookie and I were doing um, uh, Lincoln park with uh, VTX, mm-hmm. we used to not have the ability to have front fill on the stage. Okay. So what we came up with was a, a sprinkler head. It's basically, you know, a, a small version of PA that's uh, flown left and right and is pointed and is that PA is servicing those first 20 rows or whatever, similar to what you just said. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that was, happens in many theaters. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was awesome, too, because we were able to get a stereo in there. So wherever you were in, in, the, in, in the mosh pit, essentially, you had a stereo image. So yep. that all worked. Was One thing cool. I will say about your application specific front fill is... If you're if you know how your mix sounds through a certain tonal balance with the PA, yeah. uh, whether you're you're flat on the you know mids to highs or you're sloped down or sloped up, whatever it may be, I have found it useful t- to tune that other PA like that. But, Absolutely. But if you're really close to it, maybe it's too loud, so you got to play at the level. But if it's too loud, then maybe slope it down. You want you want to be able to. Here, here's what I find is is engineers will walk into a zone and go, huh, yeah, okay, that that's that's right but they're only there for a few seconds. If they had to sit there for 90 minutes, right. they, their ears would be bleeding at, you yeah. know, about it. So you have to sit there and think, okay, if, if I had the seat, would I be pissed? Would I be mad? Right. Put yourself in that situation, adjust your level accordingly to that or your tonal balance to that. If it needs to be a high yeah. level, think, think about your tonal balance. But, yeah. but, Absolutely. but your general trend to the PA also carries over to front fills is, is, what, I, is what I found a lot of times for, for this stuff, unless you sure. have noise off the stage. I find with, you know, I mean, it's important. Time is important. You need to align all these things. But I always find any speaker in addition to the left and right, I end up turning down and sneaking up right up to where, okay, now it's giving me some unintelligibility. And that's Mm -hmm. usually where I leave it. I don't do this whole game of like having the source come from that. Mm -hmm. I want it just there enough to fill in what's happening. That's just my, the way that I usually work. Sure. All right, Cookie, what's next? Well, let's see. Oh, slide hangs. Oh, yeah. So here's a caveat. If time allows, multi-make measurement of the side array, side array is ideal for shading. Otherwise, if the side array is the same loudspeaker model, you can copy EQ and shading information to the side array and be close. Be close. This is if you're trying to save time. 
Yeah, just so, so again, you, same same loudspeaker model, similar array size, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so just be I, cautious. I, there's been situations where I've taken the shading in the bottom four circuits. Uh, it, as long as it looks like it makes sense, like it, they're similar throw, it doesn't just copy it over there and, and go. If you have time, then then do it like you do the main PA and, and, yeah. and do it well. Um, but once that once that is, once you figure out what you're going to do on that side hang, uh, place a microphone on the edge. It's just like the front fields. Place a microphone on the edge of the main array high frequency and side array, array high frequency converge where, the, once again, the point where you're going to hear both sources. Mm -hmm. Capture response to the main array and match the side array to that level and delay. Remember, Haas effect is always an option. I yeah. tend to, uh, even in the side hangs, localize the sound from, from the main PA. The main. Um, it, yeah. It, it's, it's really weird to me to sit in a dark room and, and hear sound coming from from somewhere else and it's definitely not the stage. So you, you know that there's, there's gonna be a PA hanging over there. So I, I tend to move it all, all towards that. And whereas yeah. once again, if you turn the side, side hang off, it's suddenly, whoa, wh where'd everything go? But you don't, you don't notice this, this weird sound source from halfway up the stage off the side. You, you know, you wanna, the eyes are gonna be on the stage. You wanna keep the brain on the, on the stage as well. Yeah, and I know you're going to show a graph here of the semicircle, the arc, and how you go about things. I think it's, it's uh, one of the tricks that we do uh, on a lot of the award shows, and, you know, shout out to Ron Reeves, you know, is you had uh, your fifth microphone at the front of the house location, and I use that a lot where I'll take a trace of, say, for example, the house right PA and kind of snap that in, and then I'll take a trace of whatever that front of house mic is seeing of the you know, turn on the side hang just by itself and, and capture that and then turn the two together, mains and side, and see how the side hang is polluting the main hang at the front of house location. I think you, you want to know when you're, you know, at the console, you know, how the side hangs are contributing to your main PA. And so you have to be cautious with that. Absolutely. Uh, especially in the daytime, you know, maybe it's, you know, a lot of reflection off the seats and it's just messy. You can't really tell what the main PA is doing, but you also have to consider when the audience gets in there, you're not going to have as many reflections yeah. off the hard seats. Yeah, especially on the low frequency and the mids, you know, you, you really want to know, like that's why your your arc picture here is very important. Yep, so let's step, let's step into that. Now, if the rigging location of the side array is not ideal, the entire front PA, because this is how, it, my, personally, my, my routine starts with the front stuff, flown array subs fills may need to be delayed back to the side array. Mm -hmm. And another caveat is points should be drawn on an arc in the rigging plot, but day-to-day -day show changes may affect location. So whenever I'm asked to produce a stage plot, I figure out where, the, where I want the PA to be. And starting from left to right, those little rigging points, that's the side hang, then that's the sub hang, then a main, main left, main right, sub, and side. What I do is draw an arc originating from the upstage center of the, the stage and just sweep it around and try to point position the downstage points of those arrays on there. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing to do is actually take the subs and fly them behind the PA. That helps with throw. That's amazing if you need to throw your, your sub information a long distance. But the most important part here is that side hang to main PA arrangement. If it's on an arc, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in time more without any adjustments to it as you start to curve. Because as you see my little guidelines are with 90 degrees, that's, that's where they're going to overlap. So it actually helps. In this case, that's the, where they do overlap initially. The main PA is the first arrival because it's the shortest distance. So it kind of localizes. And as you walk around the side, it's, it, you start to move into the other zone. But that's, that's, that's something I didn't learn until later on in my career of, okay, somebody else is always doing stage plots or rigging plots for me. How, how do you actually generate this? So <laughs> this is just done in, in SketchUp and, you know, because I'm faster at SketchUp than, than I am at CAD. But you can translate the coordinates to the CAD drawer or to the rigging team and, and, and go from there. Yeah, so, you know, again, you know, it's important that you, if you're going to be the, the system engineer and you're there for those locations where before the PA gets in the building, I, I would say that probably, what, 50% of your shows, by the time you get there, the PA is already flown? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, so, last but, couple of years, yeah. Right. So, but uh, if you are carrying uh, PA or if you are uh, going to be at the venue in time to see the PA go up, try to make it a point to get in there, you know, with the riggers and have a conversation about it because you know if you show up at 3 p.m. it can you know don't don't ask for the rigging points to be moved. That's probably going to be a bad day. Because you can't blame them. They're, they're trying to do their job as quickly as possible to get out of the way so everybody else can go on. So th they may be looking for dead hangs, and absolutely their, their job isn't isn't to know audio physics. It's it, it's not. That's your job. 
But if you can speak to them in, once again, part one, uh, human relations here. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you speak to them in terms of, hey, there, there is a reason for this. You know, this is my reason. If you want to, you know, if you want more in depth, we can certainly do that. But, but th there's a reason why I'm asking for this. I know it's harder on you, but it makes the show better. Just have that, have that conversation with them. But at least you have an idea of where you're coming from, what you're looking for, so you can speak to them. I'm not trying to say it needs to be a five basket and what shackles and all that stuff. I'm just talking about, that's their job. I'm just talking about where, where I would like these points. Because a few yeah. degrees, if, for instance, the downstage main array, a few degrees off on the PA is, is you know, tens or, you know, hundreds of feet sometimes, maybe not hundreds of feet, at the, at the back room where you're moving, moving the coverage point. Just a few degrees makes a big difference, 240, 280, 300 feet. Yeah, absolutely. And you probably want to find out that day, hey, you know, this, this show, it got sold 180 or it sold 210 or it sold whatever. So you might have to, you go, okay, I'm only carrying one side hang. I'm not carrying, you know, two side hangs. And you might have to make a decision. So, okay, how far off axis can I, can I spin this, you know? So, you, you know, these are conversations that you want to have uh, early on. And there's, there's also nothing which, which I should have talked about on, on the previous slide. I go for at least 21 feet separation between the main array and the side array if they're the same length yeah. so if, if it's a 14 box hang on both sides their pattern control is is similar their operating frequent you know range is similar yeah. so if you get 21 feet then your half wave length interference is about 45 hertz and typically uh you know your, your sub crossover point is at 60 so it, the the interference is, is going to be out of there. No, absolutely. You, want, you, want, you want, you want better interaction between, between the arrays. If your cider hang array is smaller or maybe it's operating frequency range isn't as low, you can bring it in a little bit closer um, and, and get away with it without having adverse uh, low frequency interactions on the, on the main PA. Yeah, definitely in the crossover area, you know, if you're at 60 plus minus, you know, all the way down to 50, 55 Hertz, you know, you want the low frequency components of the mains, both hangs to actually be constructive with the subs. You don't, you don't want to have a destructive relationship between your mains and your subs in the crossover area. That that's a, a lot of times we see that when the side hangs are just hung too, you know, too close, you know, and you know, the wrong, in the wrong arc. And now you have, you know, what we, Call a destructive interference between your side hang and your sub, you know. So just be careful with that. You may you may have to yeah you may have to high pass the side hangs and just absolutely, let, absolutely. Let low frequency spill from the main. Absolutely, um, it's one of the things I check as a mixer all the time is turn the sides off, turn them back on, turn the sides off, turn them back on. How much are the sides screwing me over? Absolutely, um, you know. And yep. you may be able to get away with you know dipping them three dB or or something like right. that. And if you're if you're utilizing Haas effect, you're okay with, with that because you, you keep your localization. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's the, the most important part is the bulk of the audience out in front of the stage. You still have to cover the sides. Uh, they're, they're still important, but it's, you have to figure out, it's, a, it's always a compromise with, with all yep. this stuff as you have always more, more zones interacting. But all speaking right. of zones interacting though, an alternating or reverse stereo alignment of adjacent arrays, mains to sides, uh, move my slide here. Uh, mm -hmm. or sides to 270s will yield a better image for the audience members between zones. Alternating stereo signals to adjacent arrays opens up the margin of error for delay time between arrays. Think mm -hmm. of all the harmonizers or all the reverbs, the stereo reverbs, or the, all the padding that you do. If you reverse your stereo image, for instance, you know, the side hang on stage right would be, would be, uh, be the right signal. Then your main is the left. Then they have the right, right main. It's just, just, just reversing. And this also goes for front fills too. If you have uh, like a, a vocalist, for instance, like a, a, a big, okay, Enrique Iglesias, you know, that, that kind of thing where it's, it's all about the vocal and the reverb. When you sum the reverb to mono, it's going to sound yeah. raunchy. So you can also do this with your front fills. And like, as Pooch mentioned before, we had our, our, our mosh pit uh, mini PA and I, I had reverse stereo image those as well. So if you're standing between the main PA and one of the mosh pit fills, you still had a stereo image and on axis, you had a stereo image and, and vice versa. It just makes more sense. And stereo is, is a smear of time essentially. So because when you place your microphone to set your delay time, it's correct in that one spot and it's slightly off everywhere else. So if you send your, you know, re reverse your stereo image, it just, it's just a wash. It just helps your stereo, stereo imaging. All that stuff. Right. It's difficult if you have a mono PA because uh, then there's no place to hide if you have oh, a mono, mono source. Mixing mono is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Worse. So, 
So all that is done. Uh, what I would do then is capture delay time, the FOH mic, and this will tell you how much to anticipate your cues and throws. If you normally are 100 milliseconds out from, from the PA, and that's kind of how your rhythm is set and you anticipate your throws, your guitar things, or, or all that stuff, suddenly one day you're 150 or 175 milliseconds. You need to think about that. Now you're moving that fader, you know, and it, you know an eight, eighth note or sometimes a full beat ahead of when that needs to happen because your, electro, your electrical you know, response is, is instantaneous nearly, but your, your sound is really slow. So in order to have it, have the guitar solo hit at the right time, you need to be anticipating that. Even though you're listening from, you're handicapped essentially, you're, you're, you're listening on, on a delay. But just, just pay attention to that. If, it, if it's within you know, 10, 15 milliseconds, it's usually okay. But as you start getting 50 milliseconds out or things like that, you, just in the back of your mind, when, if, you're hitting, if you have an active mix and you're hitting your cues and things like that, you need to take that into account. But this also is useful in that you can delay your recording to bus if you have one, back to the FOH audience mics, using this delay time if you want to print a console mix with the audience response. This hmm. is something that I know, I know Pooch has done, I do with, with, uh, with my console setup. I have the front of house mic sitting right next to my stereo VP88. So I know how far from the PA that, that microphone is. So my stereo bus gets routed to another bus on that bus, which is just the two mix that gets delayed back to that audience mics through a matrix. And then that gets printed as well. And that's just a quick, fast, easy way. I don't have to go into a DAW and assemble it and add the audience mic, or if there's a live stream or something like that, it, it's, you know, as, as if you're, you're at front of house, you're, you're hearing the audience, you're hearing sure. all the ambience from the PA, the rubble, but you're hearing, hearing the mix. It's just a quick and easy way to do it. Why not use that same mic to do multifunctions? It's also your SPL, all that stuff. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, with the entire, this is something, for, Irina, this is what I'm thinking about here. The entire loudspeaker system unmuted, short level blasts of pink noise will excite sending waves in the room. An RTA with a low number of averaging will show what frequencies hang in the room. So take note of these, set an EQ filter marker. If the sending waves become too, too distracting at showtime. Now your target curve or your, your tuning during the day may show that yes, you need that 35 Hertz. But if you're in the show and it's too distracting and it's, it's masking things that you're, you're trying to make decisions on, kick drum to bass guitar, things like that. If you have that marker in there, you can kind of drop it in quickly and, it, and just, it just analyze, it, is it correct? Is, is it help me? Does it, does it not distract me anymore? And then also make a decision of if you need that information in there. Some arenas, I mean, we've all been in the arenas where the low end is just four or five, six seconds on, on some of those frequencies and you have to think, okay, can I get away without it? Is it going to make the show too thin? But at least during the day, you know, maybe it's 37.8 hertz, something like that, something very fine. And you can see that. It's one of the things that I do as a mixer first when a system engineer hands me over uh, the PA is do some short throws of pink to see what the room does. And also uh, to hear, um, I think Raul, you pointed this out and, and I you do it all the time, hear any mechanical things that are happening in the room too. Yeah, in those kind of situations where we can go into an arena or a large venue and we have the, you know, maybe no audience or, or maybe there's a minimal audience, you know, uh, uh, usually we like to sweep, you know, a tone, you know, that goes maybe from, you know, 300 hertz down all the way, you know, through the subs, because there may be a lot of mechanical systems in the building, or there could be road cases or anything else that can get excited. And you might be in the middle of sound check and hearing something rattle, and you might go, uh, is that the PA? And it's not, it's just something that is just getting energized because of the subs or anything else. So you want to kind of know, you know, it could be the structure of the stage. You know, we went through that, yeah. you know, at Rock and Rio when the entire, you know, remember in 2006 when that, you know, it was all metal, corrugated metal stage. And we turned on all, you know, 72 subs, that thing rattled like maracas on steroid. <laughs> so you, you want to know ahead of time, you know, what some of the things, because some things you'll be able to correct and some things you'll just have to deal with, live with. Yeah. So it's, it's important. I like uh, what you were saying, Cookie, about the, the, the burst of energy. A lot of, I remember watching uh, Steve Guest, you know, back in 99, you know, doing Ricky Martin, you know, where sometimes he would just blast, you know, some, a little bit of pink noise into the PA. He hadn't had a sound check. It was a festival. So if you can train yourself to kind of quickly go lows, mids, highs, and kind of knowing your mind 
where is the balance, you know, of those three band passes, the lows, the mids, and the highs, and you can quickly go, uh, I think I'm going to have to shell some of that down just going into my show. You know, it gives you a quick idea of, okay, where, where am I at? If you're walking into a PA that you don't know, you should at least in your mind, it goes back to, you know, your, your mix and your process. In your mind, you, can, you should know what should be the spectral balance, you know, of, what, of, of the system. That's, that's yeah. ear training, right? Like, yes. you know, I can tell you, um, you know, and this is not me like bragging. I, I'm just saying that I can tell you with only pink noise what the balance of that PA is going yeah. to be like. And so yeah. if that's my only tool, if I get 10 minutes between a set change and I'm, you know, can give some short blasts of pink noise, I can actually make, you know, conscious decisions for the beginning of when we come out of the shoot, blast right. a little pink noise and go, oh man, it's sounding a little bright right now. Let's do something. Yeah. Else. And this is just big, you know, big paintbrush, right? You can, you're not talking about, oh, I need oh. to have a, you know, 2 dB down a 2.6K Q of 4. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're this talking about balance of the balance. PA. You know, right. trends where you go, eh, shelve it down 2 dB on the highs kind of a thing, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it, it'll almost have, even though it's pink noise, it'll almost have a note to you. I mean, mm -hmm. this stuff, it, it almost has a pitch to me um, with a balance of the, of the different zones. But like you said, definitely ear training. Yep. Uh, things to consider, you know, mix engineers should have conversations with their system engineers regarding array trim and length of the array. If you are the mix engineer, give feedback on how the system handled and felt so that you can, so that the system engineer can work to, to provide that experience daily. It is not always best to hang the arrays as high as the chain hoist hooks will allow. What prompts me to say this is tent structures such as Ford Amphitheater outside Tampa, Woodlands outside Houston. These are just U.S. Uh, locations. Montage Mountain in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, th I've, I've had situations, for instance, Montage Mountain, I think the opening at the back of the audience is only eight and a half feet off, off the ground. Mm -hmm. But you're hanging your, your PA at, you know, you can hang it up to 35 feet to the top box or something like that. But the problem is the tent actually slopes down in front of where you're hanging. So my best results have been hanging that, hanging a shorter array uh, lower and try to shoot that top box out that back, that back opening. I'm trying to not excite the tent too much. Yeah, if the uh, tent's like this and your PA is right, you know, in it, it's yeah. blowing here and then coming off the side of it. What he's talking about is bringing it down and now you're blowing through the actual opening. And situations like that, shading is much more important because you, you, you know, you know, it's, it, SEs are always taught, oh, hey, get the PA up as high as possible. That way, right. it's an even coverage and, and all that stuff. Okay, but that's that's in an open area, open air or in arena. If you have a physical structure in front of your PA, you don't want to be hitting that. That's the whole point of line arrays. Point the speakers where it's not going to reflect off the building. Yeah, and then, you know, in some in some situations, you know, you want to dialogue with production team ahead of time. I know in your case, you know, Pooj, you know, with Maiden, audio is extremely important to them. So your request carries a lot of weight. You know, in TV land, you know, where I spend most of my time, it's gonna be like we don't want to see the PA, so you got to trim at forty feet above the lighting grid. So it's that kind of a thing. Yet they're still expecting it to be this, you know, dynamic punch coverage kind of a show. So you know, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and also trimming the bottom of the arrays, main side subs, if your f subs are flown, to the same height yields better imaging in the money seats, but could be a sightline issue. This is something that I, I see a lot, and I've, I've tried it when I was younger, and then I've gone this route as I've uh, done more shows. I'm not, I'm not worried about the, 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 the top height, the top box of, of the main and the subs. I try, I, I try, or sorry, of the sides and the subs. I try mm -hmm. to trim all the bottoms, the money seats, the, the front rows that are down there, that are paying, paying the high money, if you can trim all that down, your reverse imaging from your main and your sides, it's, it's just better. It, it, you know, and it's, 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 it's talking of the money seats. I think everybody should also remember, look, you know, aim for the barricade <laughs> because yeah. a lot of people are going to be against that barricade. Even if you have, you know, maybe your, your first row of chairs might be six feet you know, be after the barricade, but there's going to be a lot of people at that barricade. So I try to aim for the barricade whenever possible, you know, that, that still gives me whatever, six to eight feet to the stage. You know, uh, a lot of times, you know, we're barely making the first row, which means that everything from there to the barricade, you just missed it. And you might have, you know, somebody from, from the artist that just stepped into the minute and just stuck their head in there and go, I don't know, it sounds kind of dull. But if you go sit on the chair, it sounds great. You go, well, that person didn't sit at the chair. So just kind of keep that in mind. 
this brings up a really good point about communication about all kinds of things with your production manager, your security team. I had an artist that I worked with where the guys would literally build the barricade at like 6 p.m., you know, two minutes before doors. And inevitably, they would place it not where I thought they were going to put it, <laughs> right. put it four feet this way. And so then I would walk up there and be like, well, guys, this isn't in my coverage anymore. And why are you doing this to me 10 minutes before doors are open? You know? Yep. Um, so, and I've had huge conversations with live nation reps about when yep. they sell, you know, Front 290 yeah. degrees when you've only got boxes enough for 180, you know? Yeah. So we've these, always these assumed all things that you, you know, yeah, we've, we've always assumed that, Whatever row they told me is the front row, we've always now assumed on these TV shows that they're going to put another row in front of it just because they just can. Yes. And then, you know, oh, no, we're going to stop at that VOM H. Well, we, we're going to cover another 10 degrees just because, oh, yeah, we decided to add some guests of the band. These are, they're not soul seeds. They're just comps. Oh, great. You're going to come the friends of the band where there's no PA. Yeah. That's f fantastic. Fantastic. That's always work out well. <laughs> and that's part of the reason possibly why audio guys are always so grumpy. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're planning for the worst. You're planning just to get, you know, of course you, they did that. You know, yeah. You're always expecting the worst. My, <laughs> my favorite thing with uh, Jay-Z was they would put Beyonce, like, in some weird, you know, like a, a suite somewhere that's not even where you can see the stage right. with some internal speaker that isn't even, like, I don't even know what it is. I, you know, there were a couple of days where they're like, you know, uh, oh, it just doesn't, it doesn't sound that good where Beyonce is. And I'm like, well, where is she? <laughs> <laughs> Why is she, she like, oh, you know, up here with me? In the suite that's behind the whatever that doesn't have any speakers pointed at her, you know? So those are all conversations, man. Yep, know. absolutely. Expectations, expectations. Yeah. And the other thing you'll notice is, as you go bounce between big arrays and, and small arrays, uh, longer arrays feel and tune differently than short arrays due to their summing and pattern control. I've caught a lot of grief over the years for putting up as many speakers as I possibly can yeah. to keep it consistent for the engineer or, or myself. It's not, again, it's not about SPL, it's about coverage. And the smaller arrays to try to make them do something that they don't want to do, they don't want to do that low frequency, they don't sum as much, it's, it's more manufactured. A bigger array just it sums better, it just has more transient, it's punchier. It's just, you know, it, it's like running yeah. an engine at, at 9,000 RPM, you know, burning a whole lot of gas or you're, you're, you have it idling. I'd rather just have it idling and have it be able to be responsive to all that. But as an engineer, mm -hmm. you, you may not realize, a young engineer anyway, you may not realize the, the difference that that makes. And it, it's huge, it's a huge difference. And for the SE, it's, it's faster to, it really is faster to tune a bigger array. Even though there's more zones, it just responds as you would expect it more. The smaller yeah. rays get kind of get a little squirrely and you have interactions with, with other rays and, and things like that. Absolutely. We would show up to um, <laughs> outdoor amphitheaters with Lincoln Park and fly 16 deep on the main and the sides of VTX 25s. <laughs> uh, and people would just be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like literally guys are like, what are you, you know, they're like, this is going to be the loudest show ever. And I'm like, nope. You know, it's, it's one of the things you're learning. I remember watching J.D. Brill, you know, uh, you know, when, you know, 72 S4s per side and you go, you have enough PA, it's 144 cabinets. He goes, in the show was still at 98, you know, he just, oh, yeah. he stayed on that mark, you know, same thing with Natal, you know, when, when we were doing Kravitz, you know, with the 89 rig back in the day with Sunny Image, it's like sometimes we, the array was so long that the bottom two cabinets, we just turn off the mids and the highs. And yeah. it's like, he just, you know, why production manager wanted, and he wanted every cabin. He wanted all the lows. And so it matters. Know. It matters. I mean, absolutely. Uh, inevitably, you know, people would come back to us at the end of the night and be like, it wasn't loud and it sounded amazing. And it's like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't have to turn it to 11. Yeah. Great deal. All so right. as we talked about all this philosophy and technical thing, remember there's no right or wrong way to tune the system for your mix. There may, however, be more appropriate and quicker methods to achieve the desired result. Just remember the ultimate goal here. It's about the emotion, the feeling, and the memory the audience has with the performance. It's not about you. It's not about the band. It's about the ticket holders. The whole reason they're going to that show is the experience and how it makes them feel. And they're going to have a memory of it. Yeah. Hopefully it's a memory of, God, that show sounded awesome. And then the band comes back and, and they are repeat customers for, for the band as well. So you know, one, one thing on this cookie, I think uh, 
not to make it, yeah, there's a wrong way to do it. That's a whole other presentation. But uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> that's the next, that's part three. Um, part three. Uh, yeah. I think it's important that uh, we have lived this through, you know, at JBL, but I'm sure it also happens at all the other brands, which is the more that our clients, our, our uh, engineers, system engineers that use our systems, learn our software platforms, learn the product, you know, learn whatever aiming software you're using, the better you the better results you're going to produce and the less sort of creative you have to get a, you know go, you know when you're tuning the system you'll find that the the better you learn to use the aiming software the better you learn to do your performance manager work your system tuning gets easier faster with better results the less you have to tune because you use the right tools in the process and this translates to whatever system you use this is not a jbl thing so point being again it's up on you you know you if you're the system engineer well you know you need to go and do the homework and get yourself uh, as educated as you can on each of those systems that you're going to be working if you know that you're going to be doing a you know a year-long project with the banner, you're going to be working with four different systems that you specified on your on your advance. Well, you should at least know how to get around those PAs, you know, don't start specifying something that you haven't actually looked at any part of it. So I'm sure you have, you know, gone through training on many of the systems you use, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. Get, get educated. Yeah, if the speaker's not not deployed correctly, it's, you're already losing. You know, there's nothing, no, there's no point in trying to electrically correct it. It's, it's, it's absolutely fixed, fixed at that point. All right. So that's the end. Let's, uh, let's open this up to questions. All right. Hopefully we have some answers. Yeah. So some of the questions are interesting and some of them are related to this. I know you answered some of them already on the yep. Q&A box. So I'm going to grab some of the ones that are still unanswered and then we'll go through them. Uh, so Gary had a question that is not really related to this presentation, but maybe we can talk about it anyway. Um, he was asking us to touch uh, combining or mixing up uh, condenser microphones that are phantom power versus uh, condenser mics that are USB powered. If you find any any behavioral differences, you know, when something that is USB power versus something that is, I guess, phantom power from a console. Um, any I, I comments guess, on that? I guess the biggest difference would be the, the USB is only going to have five volt rail uh, in order to, to power that. So some of the bigger uh, condenser plates are going to require more power. Um, other than that, I'm not really sure. I haven't done really a comparison between. Um, Me either. For, like, yeah. Uh, uh, what microphone was it? Well, for instance, like, like electrosonics, you can either select 48 volts or five volts. Some microphones will work at five volts. Some like the Earthworks requires 48. I've never right. really flipped it back and forth. I just try to go for what the manufacturer specifies for the voltage. Got you. Uh, let's see. Uh, sharing. So I know you answered a question here from Curtis that I like. It says, is your aim on your mix, uh, you're looking for a flat response. So I guess now that you, you, you tuned the system, you did your target curve, you know, what, as you're mixing the show, you know, what is your, what is your aim here? What are you, what's your goal? Are you trying to stay in that target curve? That's where your, your mix translates to that? Uh, I think so. I mean, in general, when I'm talking about my mix, you know, this is the whole look at it or listen to it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you look at stuff and it just looks wacky, but it sounds great. I mean, you know, the smart is not like the, you know, I don't sit there all night looking at my smart curve going, oh, well, you know, I got to get the, that little 2K is point dB out, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's not about that. It's about how it sounds. And also music is um emotional and has some you know changes sure uh, that happen you know from a verse to a chorus etc 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 but in general i i use the term of a linear mix because you'll get the most impact coming out of your console by mm -hmm. having a linear mix and if you're just getting started and as a mixer it's something to shoot for something to look at and this is not something that I'm doing as a master bus EQ. This is a cumulative thing that's mm -hmm. happening in my mix, starting, you know, at input side, all the way traveling out to the, um, to my buses to get things to combine literally, you know what I mean? So, um, is that even a word literally? Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, um, uh, you know, and so that the output of my console without using EQ on my master bus is a pretty relative linear curve. Um, and I know you kind of are the same way, Cookie, right? Yeah. The only thing that's on my, on my master bus is, is dynamics and uh, just some flavor things, some distortion, yeah. things, things like that. I mean, I will do a little bit of master EQ if there's something a little bit wacky, but I, if I have to do that, I will then over the course of time, maybe a couple of days, go figure out what I have to address to get rid of that master bus EQ. Yeah. Very nice. I, I, find, I find the smart is actually useful for validating something that you've heard. Like if, yes. if, if you hear, okay, where is that? Is it 4K or is it 5K in that vocal? And you can kind of compare what you're sending out of the console with, you know, for instance, an RTA or, or, the, or the, uh, the, the transfer function. Where is it? Is it 4K? Is it three and a half? It, mm -hmm. Like I heard something, look at the screen just to, just to validate exactly where it is because you're busy mixing. And then with one hand, you can maybe or tell your system engineer or reach over and, and address it. Right. But yeah, it's a lot of, there's, there are times where I'll, I'll set the, the target curve to, to home base essentially. But then listen to listen to the PA. The PA doesn't doesn't like that. Maybe it's it's just maybe mm -hmm. it's ribbon tweeters or something like that, and they're they're too dull on the top end. So okay, well that that didn't work. So now it's just a shelf on that. Um, right. But, but as but also like we talked about in part one, you can set two different PAs to the same tonal balance. And they're gonna feel different on the mm -hmm. face. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that's the thing. You have to listen to it. You have to feel it and then decide is, is it evoking the same emotion to me that the, you know, the PA from the day before had or my favorite PA? Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, the amount of harmonic distortion you might have, you know, transients, dynamics, power compression, those are all things that come into play through the mixing process. So it's important that you kind of know that ahead of time. You know, uh, Cookie, there was a question that you answered regarding what is the source this is a question from Sam Jones, and he was asking, you know, the source that, that we use, you know, during the amplifier loudspeaker testing process, you know, as you said, coming directly from the amp, it's mono pink noise. Uh, I think it's, so it's important to, to clarify that we, we like to use pink noise simply because it's, it has the entire spectrum, you know, you know, in there, when you're doing your impedance testing, when you're doing your, you know, polarity checkups, you know, just try to do it with, with pink noise. Uh, if the time allows, if you're in a place where you can actually play some music, you know, it's always great, like Pooch was saying, to listen to the PA with, you know, ideally with something that you know. Uh, I've, I've worked with several engineers, whether it's Brett Divins or Natal, where they're not going to come and play pig noise. You know, they let me do my gig and then they'll come and play what they know. You know, and the, you know, and then we have a conversation about how they feel about the PA. I would think that you guys have the similar situation where, you know, your system engineers will do their work, and you will come and either play a song that you that you like, or you might use your virtual tracks. What's your approach there for the final kind of okay? The PA is where it needs to be. Do you want to go for that, Pooch? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, everyone knows, uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty vocal about, I, I really don't use um, alternative music all that much. My system engineer will probably play some things that I learn um, what his stuff sounds like, his or her stuff sounds like. And so I can have an idea uh, before I get there or get started. But generally, I'm, it's all about virtual playback for me. Um, fire up last night's show. Um, and I'll, I'll fire it up, you know, in full roar, uh, maybe without the vocal at first um, and listen to what it does in the room, all those kind of things. And then sometimes I break it down into instrument, like listen to the drums by themselves or whatever to hear a specific part of the PA. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's like fire it all up and let's see what happens. And then throw the vocal in there to see, cause it's the loudest thing in my mix to see what, how it excites the room. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. How about you? Cookie? So th that you brought up something that, uh, that we talked about in part one is, is a consistent SPL. So I used to listen to uh, LCD sound system, Daft Punk is playing at my house. That used, that used to be my track. Every SE has a track and that whole crew is like, oh God, there's that, there's that song. God. Yeah, there, there's <laughs> somebody in the session tonight who, was, who wanted to thank you from playing Daft Punk for a hundred times. <laughs> Um, but since I the advent of that song, <laughs> because of you, really, really nasty hi hat, you could tell the, your conversions points between the you know between zones. But anyway, uh, since the advent of virtual playback, it's 
you're not playing those songs that that's what those songs don't matter for the show what matters is what the band sound, sounds like and if you use virtual playback it also tells you how the backline rig is sounding from the previous night it's the current state of the backline rig because sometimes things change you know totally. um so yeah definitely virtual playback set the level there like uh like Poosh mentioned not the vocals um uh, so I, I typically what works for me is setting my my spl uh, three dB lower than than you know probably ninety seven dB with with the band without without the vocals. I typically go for bass and drums first because I want to hear the impact. I want to want to want to hear that, hear the meat of the PA, and then I'll turn everything else on and then and then do my walk. But it's it's also you have you have to be comfortable with how it sounds in front of house compared to the rest of the room, and you have to just keep that in mind. Um, maybe you're in a bad mix location. Maybe you're under a balcony and the low end is just building up and it's it's just wicked down there. Mm -hmm. But when you walk in the audience, it's all good. It's all fine. So you just have to make a mental note of, okay, it's only bad to me. So when I'm making these decisions, these, these relationship decisions, just keep that in mind. Maybe, you know, 80 Hertz is way, way too loud at mixed position. But if you walk the room and you kind of get a feel for it, it you, you kind of settle in and go, okay, that's what it sounds like out here. That's what it sounds like here with, you know, with your music playing. I want to put, throw out one more thing here that maybe, you know, yeah. I've watched people do, uh, which is in all tests and all playing of virtual playback and all playing of music, never do I do instant on things. Always it's fader up. You know, yeah. and that includes in speaker system when I'm checking, you know, stuff in front fill, you know, it's never unmute. It's always fader up. All right. Let's be courteous to all of our people out there um, and not, you know, I mean, you don't know. Someone could be standing two feet away from that and not realize that you're about to hit them with 102. <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah. we have very, uh, on TV shows, you know, very particular rules as to like, look, you know, riggers up, no PA up kind of a thing yeah. where we have to be, or you have to call it on the radio on everybody's channel or whatever the case so that people, like you said, let's be courteous, but you know, there's a safety issue here, you know, somebody, you know, could be in a compromised position and all of a sudden you crank this up at 110 dB and that, you know, they, they might drop a piece of gear on somebody else. So every time that I start my virtual playback, my master fader is at the bottom I start it and I roll it up to zero. It's yeah. never an unmute. Absolutely, that's a great point. Hey, uh, Cookie, there was a question about the position of your tuning mics. Uh, you normally have them, your four mics that you're using on axis. Oh yeah, absolutely on axis and, yeah. and lighting the subs on axis. Uh, that way your time is, is correct through more parts of the venue than, than than yeah we have seen some approaches where we're doing larger install projects and we're looking at averaging them so as far as you know whatever eight microphones 12 microphones and in that kind of situation we've done the christmas tree approach where you might go plus minus 30 degrees you yeah. know from the center and you know in most of today's systems you those uh of axis the microphone should measure uh, very much like the on-axis, you know, PA. I think nowadays a lot of the, the current touring PAs have a very good response within their coverage area. Um, there was a question regarding the has effect. And I, I think that, that, you know, the case that you're trying to make is you're, you, you want to use any delays. And anytime you delay a subsystem, front fills, side hangs, whatever, you were doing it to actually keep the image of the, of the stage, of the, you know, going towards the stage. You want the oral image to actually be centered towards the stage, you know, as opposed to, you know, simply just, just not have a centric. So because then your, your brain is fighting that. You're seeing an act happening in a particular location, but your hearing is fighting that because it's hearing it coming from somewhere else. So, but, but you know, for, there's a lot of data of the house effect available and we encourage people to go and spend time, but we're basically talking about it from the point of view of just keeping the image centric uh, to the stage. Uh, let's see, somebody wanted to know if you were using Audix TM1s, is that the, your measurement mic? Yeah, uh, TM1s, and then I have one Earthworks typically that, that I would use. That's exactly what I have, one Earthworks and a bunch of TM1s. Yep. Okay, so we had an anonymous question that says, you know, in the corporate world, I often do not have a lot of room or time to tune. If you were put in a situation where you have to dump the truck, hang a VTX rig, uh, time it, and do a run-through in two hours, <laughs> well, so that two hours, I guess, includes hang it, do a run yeah. through in two hours. What would be the most efficient steps to tuning for mostly talking heads? 
So the Justin Bieber tour. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's it's line array calculator. It's it's getting it getting it deployed correctly. That's the biggest thing. And and as we, we were talking about before, you can if you need shading, you can figure out your shading, and it's pretty dang close. Yeah. To to what it's going to be. Uh, do your homework before. So yeah, you know exactly that, where you're going. It, it, I think it goes a lot to the education where you go. Don't invent on site. You know, if you know the room dimensions and you know uh, ideally your, your trim height, you know, do your LAC. Put that into your performance manager. So, you know, all you have to do is dump that into the amplifiers and you should be able to paint with a big brush. You know, you should be able to low frequency compensate for the size of the array. It's a corporate show. So my first advice on a corporate show, make sure all your high passes are on on your console. You know, get, get your inputs where they need to be because you might be fighting PA when it's really an input source problem. You know, uh, use the right big tools on this, you know, on the software, you know, array size compensation to get your low frequency and then control your, your distance compensation to get all the high frequency balance front to back. If you do that, you should be able to just apply one or two low mid filters and you should be able to go within 30 minutes. There's something to be said about physical placement, right? If Absolutely. you can get them to allow you to place the subs aligned with the tops already so that you don't have to worry about delay, you know, measuring and delaying, uh, that'll gain you, you know, lots of time. Yeah, the, the yeah. manufacturers will have usually the delay built into the into that. They're, intended uh, to, be, to be next to or within six feet of, of the main or, or find out if you need subs you know nowadays with some of the systems running down to 55 hertz is a corporate uh, show are oh, you bringing true. are you bringing subs because you want to hear them on your video that's rolls true. or because anybody really needs them so don't create problems that don't exist <laughs> and another, another thing is the thing to look out for you know the presets were done with with the subs next to the full range array if you physically separate them you may have to reverse polarity that's that's one thing to look out for anytime you have a physical distance it may be a polarity shift and then a slight time shift cool uh we had a question from tim and this is actually good for both of you when you're using an external dsp uh to EQ the system i think you carry legs right uh cookie yeah yep uh do you leave the eq flat I, I assume he means the output eqs flat on your console or do you also place an eq uh you know on your console outputs console output should, should sound in headphones and and reference monitors like you want it to sound so how you know in my case, however, however you, get, you how, get there, however you get there, but th that's 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 what you're confident of handing somebody either the AES or a left right saying here it is, as Pooch would say, here it is, we're all counting on you. My end's good. <laughs> right. Good luck. Right. So when you when you walk into a scenario, let's say for example, Cookie, you walk into uh, Summerfest, right? There's yep. a you know rig flown for you that day, you know, and you're the headliner, but there's four bands in front of you, you know, and so you are going to do your contouring of that system on your leg. Do you actually work with the system engineer to change some things on their uh, it, it, platform? It's, it's different from day to day. Typically in, in that situation, that manufacturer has FIR filters, which are much better than what I'm going to attain through uh, Adobe Lake. So I'll try to do as much as it in the PA. The stuff I'm doing isn't really that crazy. So it works for, for a lot of other bands. Um, and with today's, you can just save a file and reload a file too. So mm -hmm. if, if the house engineer has been there for three days already, and they're, they're the ones mixing all these acts, just strolling through, sure. save, their, save their file. Uh, yeah. But and then do yours, save your file. And then as you mentioned in part one, make sure yeah. the file gets recalled. But Yeah, no, it's absolutely, uh, to the, nowadays we have the ability to completely recall the entire system within you know a fraction of a second, okay? But you have to remember to do that. So if you're going to actually implement changes in the software to accommodate a guest mix engineer, uh, you are, as the system, you know, the tech looking after the PA, you have to be diligent to bring everything back to where that engineer, you know, left it during his sound check, his or her sound check. When, so I, just, when just I'm doing it. Yeah, totally. When I'm doing a festival run, there's a snapshot note in my first snapshot that says, have you asked the local you know system engineer whether or not he's recalled his settings that's like the first note in my snapshot right no absolutely you know that the last thing you want is kind of like when we're you know, mixing through a, you know a show and we're on the wrong snapshot for this song you know same thing where all of a sudden you're the system engineer you know you go into the the opening and you know the mix engineer looks at you going something doesn't sound right and you look at your computer and you go oh i didn't recall this Exactly. PA, because now you got to recall this, and you know what, how do you do that? So just just 
due diligence. Okay. Better I've not had, to change I've, it. I've come out of the hole in the first song and I knew right away that this was not the way the PA was tuned. Sent my system guy over to the guy. The guy goes, oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. And then, and then we all go, okay. So in between the first and the second song, you're going to recall. You ready? If song ends, go. Do it now. You know? Right. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's happened to me a couple of times. And if anything, if you're a system engineer and you're in that situation, do not recall the <laughs> scene until you have talked to the mix engineer. I know, you, I know everybody's thinking, okay, I'm just going to recall it, and they won't notice. Well, that's not going to happen, you know. No, so so by all means, tell the front of house mixer, hey, I'm sorry I'm on the wrong snapshot. Let me recall your scene, and, you know, they'll find the right place to do it, you know. Yep. So just, just be cautious. Cop, cop to it, but it's, it's a dance out there. We have it, a lot of power on, on our fingertips to hurt, to hurt people with, with these uh, plays, these Absolutely. Plays. Um, there was a question uh, from Ed Campus. He wanted to know if you guys delay your PA back to the kick drum. No, I don't. I don't. The, the, yeah. uh, you know, these PAs use FIRs in the presets. There's already delay in there. Uh, yeah, like I told somebody, I said, it comes pre-delay, you know, the, the, yeah. the whole, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, pre-delay. But I think most people forget that by the time, you know, the signal gets out of the loudspeaker, it's already gone anywhere from five to 10 milliseconds, depends on what, right. you know, we're doing with FIR filters in there. So it's, it's already got delay. And then the um, latency in your console, you know, I mean, it's, there's yeah. all kinds of, yeah, we're already delaying it crazy. Yeah. absolutely that's that's an old school analog approach to do that that was that was yeah. valid i mean that if you back in the days if you were doing a small theater with a jazz you know quintet or something trying to make it as acoustic as possible you might go a few milliseconds to just kind of make the pa disappear you're in a 300 foot room in a 300 people room but you know if you're in an arena with thirty thousand people uh you know not, I have done really. that if there's a monitor engineer that's struggling and it's yeah. not a normal thing that he's struggling. Like we're in a, like you said, like you're in a theater and he's like, right. dude, I, I'm, I can't, you know, I, that would be a go-to for me would be like, okay, let's try. Yeah, let's absolutely. I, I would also call attention to people who are hanging rather large side fill systems, which I'm more and more, I'm not seeing those, thank God. But if you're hanging really large side fill systems or ground stacking big, you know, side fill PAs that are not FIR process, uh, be cautious because you might end up spilling the side fills onto the first, you know, two, three rows. And that that's going to come in way ahead of your PA. So just be, sure. be cautious with that. Yep. Uh, there was a question from Aaron Kelly regarding uh, subs on an aux versus subs on a matrix from the left right bus. Uh, so what do you think? What do you guys do? As an SE, it's so much easier if the mixer is just giving a left right. Uh, and this is a conversation that Push and I had years ago. And as he tells it, I don't. He, I should let him tell the story, but I'm no, no. About. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> He came in the studio, you know, he, he came up through the studio, you mix a left, right. Uh, and, and when you're in like a, the gap or something like that, and they have a satellite speakers and the sub is 50 feet off in the corner, it sounds weird. Right. And, uh, and as you train your ear, you tend to notice that like when there's flown subs and you're off to the side between the main and the side hang, you, you, that sounds better than subs on the ground because it, you, your ear tends to hear that delay of, of the sub information but as an se you get your ratios correct and your levels and you get your zones out um mm -hmm. i've i've been in the se for tours where one engineer has been a left right and the other engineer insisted on doing an aux some consoles don't delay their aux correctly there's no no compensation so now your now your subs are out of time uh also the relationship between the mains and the subs that that i set uh, is now wildly different for, for this guy, for, but, but not the other guy, because, you know, maybe his fader's up 3 dB, which I, I guess if that's what they want, that's fine. But it's hard, it's hard to chase a moving target as an SE. You, mm -hmm. want, you want to get your job done, here it is, and get out of the way for everybody else to do their things. And, and I've adopted that as a mixer. It's, it just makes more sense to use high-pass filters, you know. Yeah, and, and the left yeah so let me, let me just add to that. There is a completely different sound between sending only your kick drum and your bass guitar to the subs and or, versus using high pass filtering and letting things like your snare drum just peek a little bit into mm -hmm. that crossover. I mean, I use high pass filters that are, I do minute adjustments and let low end parts of instruments like guitars and snares and toms and 
peek into the subs, not full range, but peek in there just a little bit. And that is a different sound than only sending individual things to a sub. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, to me, uh, sending individual things to a sub disconnects your mix. It makes your mix not be uh, cohesive anymore. Um, yeah. It's my opinion. Uh, I know that a lot of guys, you know, church guys do it all the time. And, you know, there, there's guys that make it work. Yeah. It just doesn't work for you. Me. know, we've always heard the, the sort of the statement and said, well, I don't want my vocals to go to the subs. And I'm going, well, first of all, turn on your high pass. But second of all, you know, on all of the TV shows that we're doing, you know, we're basically generating a, a, a stereo mix without vocals. So all of our music, all the music stems go to a stereo bus with no, no vocals in it. And that's feeding two stereo matrices. The first stereo matrices then gets subgroups of vocals, and that goes to the PA. And the second stereo matrix, which is a copy of the stereo bus, no vocals, that goes to all the subs, stereo. So it's basically music plus vocals, and you're just adding the vocals to the zones accordingly. You know, that way you don't end up with vocals on any of the subs, and you don't have to, you know, deal with that issue of having a disjointed mix, like Puch was saying. You yeah. know, uh, it just I mean, kind of makes it a little bit faster. I don't understand that anyway. I, I don't think that any vocal I've ever done where it's not high passed up to like 200 at least. Yeah. You know, and it's funny so, because many people you know, think that, you know, when you listen to big rock shows like your show or Metallica or whatever, that there's subs and knocks and it's actually not the case. You know, uh, it's actually all a stereo, stereo mix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? but let's point out, I still have volume control Absolutely. on the matrix between the relationships yes. between sub and low, or yeah. sub and, and highs. Yeah. Um, but but what's being sent to that matrix is is a stereo mix. Yeah, the only time we have actually done things like from a stereo aux has been things for effects purposes. Somebody's rolling a video that has whatever, a helicopter or something, and they want to just emphasize some ground subs or something. Okay, so that's a stereo aux and just for that effect. So anyway, yeah. uh, we are up at the two hour mark. Uh, you know, time flies when you're hanging out with friends. Uh, I know some people would yeah. like to have a, a third session again. Uh, I'd like to to thank you guys so very much uh, for, for for spending the day. Here's the contact information for the guys. You know, I like to I like to point out a message. That I'm sure this goes also for Cookie. Uh, a note from Brian Beachy, uh, who works at the Talking Stick Resort Arena, says I met Pooch when he was here with Iron Maiden. He is the most friendly and approachable touring front of house engineer I've ever met. Thank you for Aww. taking the time to sit and chat about your experiences. It was probably meaningless to you, but it was one of the highlights of my experience here. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, you know, Brian, after knowing these guys for the last 20 years, uh, they they take every opportunity they can to share their knowledge. We are fortunate to have them spend their day with us and I look forward to the day when we can do shows together again. So, oh, Absolutely, man. That means a lot. Thank you. And Cookie, you're a badass. <laughs> absolutely the man the legend and that's, that's is, not just my spell he, that's I'm right so pissed, i'm so pissed that he's in front of house engineer now because like, <laughs> yeah, i know he was like my guy you know? I know. And, uh, anyway but he's yep. an amazing front of house engineer and i'm super proud of yeah, him. yeah if you guys for those who are watching if you ever have a chance to either uh you know get to spend the day with cookie or pooch on any of their shows make it a point to be the system tech for the day, hang out with them because it's like going to grad school. So keep it on. Laura, I know you're there. I think, uh, I don't know, you have some closing remarks. You bet. So thanks so much guys for doing the second session. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, there was a session held on July 29th that um, Cookie and Pooch did. So if you're interested in seeing that, you can go out to the JBL brand channel on YouTube and um, catch that session. So thanks again, guys. Really appreciate your time. And we hope to see you on future sessions. All right, guys, Thank stay you. safe. And uh, we'll see you soon.